It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. My name is Mike Bernard. I'm your host. I'm also one of the CFPs on the program. And with me in the KFG studios, as always, my business partners and fellow CFPs, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Is there a decade of your life where you're going to make more crucial financial decisions than all the other decades? That's the question. If there is, it might be your 60s. So today we're going to help you make better decisions during your 60s, we're covering that and more here on the Wise Money Show. I'm licking my chops. I can't wait for that debate. We're going to get, we're going to get <laughs> to it right now. If you have a question for the program, we'd love to hear from you. You can call or text us 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000. Online, wisemoneyshow.com is where you can find us and submit questions there. And then all over social media, wherever you're at, we are there as well. Just search the Wise Money Show. All right, so we are in week two of our series, taking one decade of your life at a time, saying what are the biggest financial decisions, the most important financial advice you need to heed. And last week we started the series. We were in the 70s and 80s, you know, sort of that stage of life. Now we're in your 60s. And we this was at a request from a fan of the show. We've done similar sorts of series or discussions on this before. And I vaguely remember us trying to debate this, but I'm, I'm, Josh posed the question, is there a finance, is there a decade in your life where you make a disproportionate number of the most important financial decisions? Basically, which decade of your life do, do you make the most important financial decisions in? I would argue it's your sixties. You meant your twenties? Is that what you said? (laughs) Why your twenties? I, I'm just being difficult. I, no, it, like, no. I mean, that's when you're getting started in life. Yeah. And well, yeah. If you make the right decisions in your 20s, you'll have great decisions to make in your 60s. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I, I think we could really be obstinate and say, well, it's whatever decade you're in right now. It's the most important one you have left. I would agree. It, you know, in, in your so probably the biggest financial decision you're going to make in your life is are you going to have kids? <laughs> if we're just going to be, if we're if, cards on the table here, if you, if you don't have kids financially, you can do a lot. If you do have kids, uh, fin- and how many? Well, if you have kids financially, you can do a lot. It's just, a lot of what? <laughs> That's the question, right? A lot of diapers, a, a lot, lot of, of I, spending. I mean, yeah. A so, lot of saving money for college. So I, I think you'd have me at your 20s. It, but but it's really, your 60s is where a lot of that culminates. Yeah, you're right. Uh, are you prepared? Did you use those other decades well? Take advantage of them so that when you show up in your 60s, now you've got big financial decisions to make. Do you have great choices yeah. to select from? A- and emphasis on big decisions, right? Yeah. I mean... Uh, when you retire, for example, is one that we'll get into here in just a moment. But yeah, the the bigger options, the better choices that you've set up for yourself earlier in life, the stakes are higher when you get into your 60s. Yeah. But if you're listening to this and you say, oh, my 20s, I, I'm, I've tried my whole life to forget that decade <laughs> uh, because uh, whoever that person was that took over my body in my 20s and <laughs> did those horrible things like... <laughs> <laughs> so I so I'd say don't give up. Don't give up. If you say, Hey, I'm not in a great position and I'm in my early sixties, don't do not give up. Um, there's still hope. Yeah. All right. We're gonna hit the six areas of your financial life and the most important financial decisions that are on deck in your sixties. We're gonna start with retirement planning because honestly, this is and and this is tricky. If you listen to last week's show, it's tricky because the big idea and the premise for the Wise Money Show and Corhorn Financial Group, the work that we do is that you can't look at these six areas of your financial life independently. They all overlap. And I'll tell you a little secret. We started last week's show talking about tax planning, and the first words out of Kevin's mouth were about estate planning. And I wanted to throw my shoe at him, but it you can't like you you can't pull these apart fully. Like they all overlap. All right. And so Retirement planning is really the culmination of all of the other five areas, all embedded into into one. So let let's say, what are the big decisions in retirement? 
Yeah, well, we often talk about there being five factors that go into whether or not you are ready for retirement and and whether or not your retirement is going to be the way that, that you want it to be. It's not that different than planning like a road trip with your family. You know, you and your spouse may have very different opinions on what a great vacation looks like. I don't know if if you and your spouse came from same mentality, same approach, but uh, you know, my my wife came from a family where it's like you make a bologna sandwich, you eat it in the minivan while dad's driving, no <laughs> breaks or anything, just go go go. Is yeah. is you, that your approach? You've got Kevin? the empty water bottles in the back <laughs> just in case. No pit stops. <laughs> that's right. We stop for gas alone. That's it. <laughs> So you, you may have a different vision for starters on what your experience is going to be, but just like a, a good vacation, a good road trip, do you have everything packed? Are you fully resourced to be able to make this a great trip? The same is true for retirement as well. Do you have enough accumulated for the experience that you and your spouse have agreed upon, hopefully? And uh, it begins with, well, what age are we embarking? When are we going to retire? And for a lot of people, it does fall somewhere in this decade of the 60s. And it's one of the most important decisions that you make because you retire just a little bit earlier or a little bit later, and you have a major impact on how long your investments are going to last, what kind of lifestyle you're going to have, maybe even things like how expensive is it going to be to cover our health insurance early on? Yep, yep, yep. So I ultimately... The big, the big, for most people, the biggest financial decision you're going to make in your 60s is when to step away from that paycheck. And so that's the age. That's the that's the first of these five factors. The second. Oh, go, ahead, go ahead. Well, and I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm still back. I'm thinking of family trips and, you know, dad <laughs> saying, if you guys don't stop it, I'm going to pull the car over. And anyways, uh, <laughs> thankfully, those days are long gone. But I, I think about that. I'm like, well, what when I think about retirement, I think of some couples that I've been working with recently and the, they've got some positioning things where they're really, really like they're 98% there. And the question is, do they finish the job and get there? And they don't have to, but if they do, it makes their life so much simpler and easier. And it's easy to move a whole bunch of dirt right now with the horsepower they have at work. Uh, and as soon as they're done working, that horsepower, it just changes. Like mm -hmm. financial horsepower changes when you're done working. Likely your streams of income will change and other things. So I'm like, oh, if you can. And I, I have a, a client that I just recently met with. And she said, yeah, you know, I'm, I, I'm supposed to be retired by now, but I'm, I'm happy doing this. And we've got uh, some things uh, to do related to vehicles and house. And so we just want to do those. I'm like, well, hey, if you can hang in there, hang in there, because the, the ease of doing those things and accomplishing those things with your income is totally different than w when we're talking about income off your portfolio or off your Social Security or off of a pension or anything. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people, they'll get to the edge of retirement. They know financially they could do it but they choose to go maybe one more year, two more years, and it's it's adding in some of those sweeteners. Yeah, we want to have a little bit nicer cars, or there's a big vacation we want to fund. Maybe it makes the difference between having that uh, vacation home or that lake property and not having it. Just working a little bit longer can make a big difference. Or our house is, is now 20 years old. I'm like, what do you mean it's 20 years old? I remember when you built that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's 20 years old. We want to update the kitchen. Well, you can't say kitchen without saying <laughs> Fifty thousand dollars, please. Yeah, min minimum. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and that's just for the the oven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the age at which you retire determines how long your retirement is going to last. We don't know all of our life expectancies, obviously, and we wouldn't want to know. And and so, but the long the sooner you retire, the longer retirement's going to last. And so, knowing the age is most important. We're going to get into the other factors, that and more, coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Hello, YouTube. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show. You're at the Wise Money Show channel. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. 
and turn on notifications. What you're watching right now is our weekly one-hour talk show. That's right. I said one hour. <laughs> that airs right here on this channel, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Also on podcasts at the same time as well. But the reason it's an hour is it airs on a couple local radio stations as well. Uh, if that's too long or you want more content, good news is that's here as well. Next Why Step videos air all throughout the work week every single day. Uh, taking one financial concept and applying it to you, to your financial life, eh, maybe eight, 10 minutes, something like that. Um, topics like inflation, market volatility, HSA contributions and, and all that sort of stuff. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications. So you're going to aware every time we drop new content. And if you like the content, then like the content, leave comments as well. Thank you. Okay. So I'm thinking of how we attack this thing within this, you know, retirement plan. We've got to talk about Social Security. I, I think we hit that one next. And then we can talk about retirement spending, and that can flow into present financial position and protection planning. We can kind of okay. push those. Did together. you see the comments uh, on, was it yesterday's? Why is, no, my day's been a, my yesterday. Why is Money blur. Minute? Uh, the, uh, um, about Social Security, and you guys were saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm taking Social Security. The minute I can take it, I'm taking it. And versus, hey, I'm I'm waiting. There are two comments in in there that had you know, polar opposites. Yeah. Hmm. So need advice. I mean, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Either one of those could be absolutely the right choice. Right. Depends on your situation, and not depends on your situation. Like, hey, how do you feel or whatever? No, it depends on all six areas of your financial life and your five factor retirement plan. So both either of those answers could be the absolute wise choice for you depends on your financial plan. Yeah, and and the client that I was talking about who is now north of full retirement age is saying, well, look, I can, I know this, I can always go back six months. Yeah. So if, if I work a year beyond my full retirement age, I can go back six months. I'm like, well, when, be careful because if you work a whole year this year and in December you go back six months, Mm -hmm. you, we're hurting. So yeah. let's let's push it in next year. All right. Second segment. Okay. In your 60s, you're going to make some of the most important and biggest financial decisions of your life. What are those and how can you make great decisions? That's what we're helping you with right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name's Mike Bernard with me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on the YouTube channel. Go check it out. Go to YouTube, search The Wise Money Show. Not only do you get every episode, but all the other content that we push there all throughout the work week as well. So check us out there. Okay, we're talking about the biggest financial decisions that you're going to make by decade. Today, we're hitting your 60s. When you step away from your paycheck, when you retire, that's, that likely happens in your 60s for probably 90% of people out there. And it's likely the biggest financial choice decision of the decade and maybe even your life, Okay. Um, when you're doing that, you've got to look at all five factors to know that you can retire with confidence. Your age and life expectancy is the first one. Second is your spending, uh, and, and that gets into health insurance and inflation and whether you're still going to have a mortgage, all of that sort of stuff. Third is income, retirement income. Will you work part-time? What you, what's your decision on Social Security? We were just talking about that. Uh, will you have a pension? Will that pension have a cost of living adjustment? Fourth area is investments. Uh, how much do you have saved up? What's your nest egg? How much are you still contributing? How much more do you need to contribute? And then lastly is how much investment risk are you willing to, uh, how much market volatility can you live with? And how does that shift over your life? And so looking at those five factors, Josh calls those five choices. And sometimes they don't feel like choices, but they are, they are. They're all interrelated. If you wanna retire at age 57, You've got to have more saved up, possibly spend less, maybe even have some alternative sources of income, rental real estate, something like that. So they're all interdependent. Okay. So within this decision, I told you that the third factor is income. You've got one of the most important decisions you're going to make in your 60s is when you're going to draw Social Security. Mm -hmm. What's your Social Security strategy? Mm -hmm. Kevin was just remarking on a video that was released on the Wise Money Show channel. Two different 
comments by fans of the show right after each other, one saying, oh, there's no question I'm drawing Social Security immediately, the moment I'm able to, and the other saying the exact opposite, not in, you know, uh, as this little comment spar, but just, oh, I'm going to delay it as long as I can. Just because both of those answers may be right in your situation, you've got to figure out what is your strategy. It'd be interesting to do a study and figure out where does that decision come from for most people? You know, could, could you analyze, hey, I want to know what your decision is or what your philosophy is and tell me about your five closest friends and what they did? Because it, it sure seems like a lot of times it's peer group influences this. And they're, they're just polar opposites, as you said, different ends of a spectrum on this. And often, um, you know, we, we work with a number of people that they conclude, no, waiting till age 70 makes the most mathematical or economic sense for me. But not always, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes there's something going on in your financial life or just your life circumstances, maybe health or marital status, that sort of thing, that would tip the scales towards an earlier drawing of Social Security as, as well. But there's not a one-size-fits-all. There's not a one singular answer on this. And that's why we often turn our attention to, well, how do you uh, create the right context or the right decision for you making your own individual decision? It's not looking to your neighbors. And it's not asking your brother-in-law what they did because they've got different circumstances than you. It has to be your financial plan and a conversation that you have with your certified financial planner. And I, I realize that's completely biased advice, but it's it's the right method for making the decision. The, 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 the video where Kevin was referencing these comments were made, I laid out, okay, if you're financially strong, you're financially stable, you've done this five-factor retirement plan and, and you can retire with confidence, then... How do you make your Social Security decision? And it's really going to be based on a couple different questions, but ultimately it's all based on your financial plan. The first question is, are you healthy? If you're not very healthy, you're going to want to draw Social Security sooner rather than later is, mm-hmm. is my guess. Second, um, are you married? Because whether your spouse is still working or what your spouse's work history was, um, that, that could influence. And then the last one is, have you ever been married? Right? Are you a, a, a divorcee? Are you a widow or widower? Um, and that, depending on how long and their work history, that can influence. And so, uh, it, yeah, I mean, if you're financially strong, you've got some choices there. You've got to evaluate. This is yeah. one of the reasons why those you know, free online retirement calculators or the one that is connected to your 401k statement or when you log in, it's worth what it costs. Those things are garbage simply because <laughs> they're making some sort of assumption about Social Security and a gazillion other things that may likely not line up with reality in your situation whatsoever. Yep, that's exactly right. And you use the phrase there, if you're financially strong, or maybe we would say, if you're financially prepared to have this option, there are some people where it it makes the most mathematical sense for them to delay Social Security as long as possible. But the as long as possible part is what catches them. They don't have some other stream of income or they don't have resources that they would be able to live off of very easily to, to bridge the gap between when the paycheck ends and when Social Security begins. And so that that is where you, uh, unfortunately, you're going to be limited by the preparations that you made in earlier decades when it comes to making this decision. But leave yourself in a position where you have a choice mm-hmm. and you, you can optimize that with the help of your financial planner. All right. Okay. Go well, ahead. and if you're listening to this and you say, hey, I'm not in my 60s, I, I would say, and this goes back to another Next Why Step video that Mike did about, hey, know how many quarters uh, you need to have to get your the, the right Social Security benefits and know how the system works. So there are, might be things that you could be doing as you're approaching 60 that would that would change the outcome and then i do i do like thinking okay if if you have two spouses with almost equal let one of them let one of those benefits ride if it's possible because the the survivor when, when if you're married when one of you dies the survivor gets the bigger number mm-hmm. and so it, it, can we get a number to be as big as possible yeah that's the that's the idea. So you got to make a great social security decision. You got to optimize your social security, and there's emotions and math that you've got to consider with both of those. Okay, uh, within the area of spending, okay, that's the second of the five factors. One of the choices, or one of the areas of your financial life that's impacted there, is is your 
what you do with health insurance. We all, and we all are going to make the biggest health insurance decision of our life in our 60s. And it's going to be connected with Medicare, okay? Because Medicare still that age is 65 unless you uh, have been disabled for 24 months or have end-stage renal disease. That's when you're going to make that decision. Now, if you're still working, you can delay that decision a little bit. But typically, it's in your 60s. You're going to make a decision on Medicare. And you've got a choice. Am I going to go with traditional Medicare? That's my term of Part A, B, D, and a supplement. Or are you going to go with Medicare Advantage, which is your pain Part B, but you're opting for Part C, which is it's impossible to really wrap your mind around. But you're going to have to make that choice. Your health insurance is completely going to change at the time you need it the most, and there are strings attached, meaning it's you know there's costs attached to it that you've got to project in. So that is one of the biggest decisions you're going to make in retirement, or excuse me, in your 60s. I, I agree with that completely. I, I think I would also say another area that is impacted by your spending is how much of your spending is going to go towards taxes. You know, we, we often think of taxes, especially if you're paying too much, money slipping through the, through the cracks here. And it has to do with how you draw income out of your tax sheltered accounts. And do you have assets spread out amongst taxable investments, maybe tax sheltered, maybe even tax free? How, how much choice have you left for yourself to optimize that mix as well? And not just optimize it, but are there? Do you, should you consider doing some Roth conversions early in retirement or early 60s before drawing Social Security, maybe when you're living on some cash that you've built up, something like that? I, I want to get in a little bit more to a couple of those strategies. Then we're going to hit some other big financial decisions you've got teed up in your 60s. That and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Okay. So do we do we go into that because Roth conversions could be the reason I'm not taking social security. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The problem is if I'm doing Roth conversions and that's where all my income is coming from to get me up to a certain tax bracket, I still need income to live. Right. So there is a there's a there's some fancy footwork required there. Um but that's where we want to call out to the younger decades to say, hey, have diversification in where your money is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Okay, so... And, and be preparing, because I was working with Ben yesterday on a situation where this person... Um, Trying I, to re remain anonymous here, yeah. confidential? Yeah. So uh, anyways, there's... There's, there's a. Ch this is what I would say. In your 60s, consider your retirement assets, and if you've already, and if you already have sufficient income to be able to live, be looking at 72 or 75, because what's that pile of money going to be at 72 or 75? When required minimum distributions kicking, you're saying? Yep. And because if you're married. What's it going to be, and what's your tax bracket going to be? And if you're not married, what's it going to be? Right. Yeah. Yep. All right. Third segment. One of the most important areas of your financial life in your 60s is tax planning. We're helping you with that right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernardo. With me in the KFG studios, Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of the Wise Money Show is on podcast wherever you listen. Just check us out. Search the Wise Money Show, and uh, I was just—I was doing a live interview on the radio recently, and they said, uh, "Oh yeah, I'm going to do that right now on Spotify." I started typing in Wise Money, and we were right there. So top one, right there. So search Wise Money, subscribe to it, and then when you're there, uh, rate the program. We we appreciate that. Um, all right, we're in our this series of most important financial decisions by decade of your life, talking about in your 60s, probably the most important decade of your life for financial decision making, okay? And one of those areas within that you, you, you've really got to focus on is what are your tax decisions, okay? What's your tax plan look like in your 60s? Let's let's get into that. Kevin, you want to talk about Roth conversions and those sorts of choices? Well, if you're, hopefully by the time you're 60, you've got some diversification 
as far as tax treatment for your assets. Now, you might be 60 and say, hey, I have none. It's I have all the money I've ever saved is in my retirement plan, and I've never paid a penny of taxes on the money I put in or the growth of that money. Okay, well, that's, that's not... That's not a, necessarily a bad thing, but one of the things that you want to consider when you're in your 60s, I'd say try to be present and live in your 60s, but have an eye on 72 because that's when that money that's never been taxed is going to have to come out. And you might say, hey, I might use the decade of the six of my 60s to get money from IRA and get it converted to Roth IRA, which means I'm going to pay taxes on some of that money. Well, this, this ties back into the last segment, which is when do I take Social Security? Because Social Security, if I'm taking a bunch of money out of my IRA, converting it to Roth IRA, there's a certain, there's a certain I'm going to call it a cap, that I don't want to exceed as it relates to my tax bracket. So if I'm using some of that cap with Social Security income, I can convert less of my IRA to my Roth IRA. Mm-hmm. That might be the the situation where you say, okay, well, then I'm not going to take Social Security. I'm going to get as much from IRA to Roth IRA converted. And then at the time, when the time comes, I'll turn on the faucet and start taking Social Security. And maybe at that point in time, you're not paying tax on all your Social Security. It, that's a tough mm-hmm. sell. I'll tell you, emotionally, that's a tough sell because here's what that sounds like. Volunteer, volunteer to delay taking money out of your government coffers mm-hmm. and at the same time volunteer to give them more of your own money, right? Yeah. I'm going to do a Roth conversion where I'm choosing to pay more tax and coupled with that, so that I can do, so that I can optimize that, I'm going to not draw my Social Security away from the government. Now, the math suggests many people should consider this, but as we've made a practice of helping explore this this uh, strategy with folks, it's hard for them to really emotionally stomach that. Again, most people we we're talking about, uh, Josh, you were saying, I wonder if there's a study around how people choose to draw Social Security and if that's influenced much by their peers and surroundings. It certainly is. And I'm imagining it's certainly connected to the emotions. So many people say, I'm drawing Social Security as soon as I can. I've been paying into this thing since my very first paycheck. Time for them to start paying me, right? But if you've got, um, but that's at odds with the idea of optimizing and strategizing your taxes so that you pay the most taxes at the lowest rate. Some of it also comes down to just control as well. And and you being able to pay your taxes on your own terms instead of having it be dictated to you. And yeah, sometimes paying tax earlier, it, it seems counterintuitive. Why in the world would I pay the government more money up front earlier? Well, you would do it if it's going to save you taxes in the long run. And, and don't lose sight of the fact, Kevin mentioned this at the break, that there's coming a day out there in the future. Right now, the age is 72. It may be going up as, as time goes on. Um, but there's a day in the future where the government's going to make you start pulling money out of your retirement accounts because they want to tax you. And the, you, you need to not lose sight of that when you're in your 60s because you may be piling up more and more money in IRAs or 401ks at work. And if, if the right forecast was run, you would realize, wow, this could be a major pool of money and the government will have me pulling major streams of income out of that and I'll be paying major taxes in the future. Mm-hmm. And um, this is where I, I think it's important that starting in your 60s, if you haven't already done it before then, this is the time when you really need to get focused on multi-year tax projections where you're not just looking to see, hey, how much am I going to pay in taxes this year? Uh, What could I do to influence my tax picture this year? No, look at the next 10 years. Look out to age 72 and forecast how much income are you going to be forced to realize or, or show up on your tax return because of this whole concept of required minimum distributions. There may be a time somewhere in there, some years that are more favorable than others for you to proactively, as Mike was saying, pull money out of your IRAs and pay the tax a little earlier than necessary. And if you're still working in your 60s, that might be the case to toggle between pre-tax contributions Mm -hmm. to your retirement plan and Roth contributions. Mm -hmm. Because you might say, hey, I can't make any contributions to a Roth 
IRA. And so I can't make any contributions. And the backdoor Roth IRA strategy doesn't work because I have a, a traditional IRA. And so I'm kind of stuck. Well, no, you're not. You can actually put $27,000. Is it twenty seven? It's a lot of money. Yeah. I We hear from a lot of folks in, in their early 60s before they retire thinking, well, oh, I I hear that strategy could be doing Roth or backdoor Roth. It's too late, though. I haven't been doing this at all. What would you say to that, Kevin? Nope. It's never too late. I'd yeah. say it, if it makes sense, here's the problem. All of these ideas make sense in a vacuum. So the question is, what's right for you? Because you you want, especially in your financial life, you want a tailored suit. Mm-hmm. Now, I've never really had a tailored suit. I, I'm the, you know, get the go to Jay Riggins at the mall. Uh, do they still have that store? <laughs> I don't think so. And get the ninety nine dollar uh, special. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I got more compliments on that suit than the one I bought at David's over in <laughs> Valparaiso. So. Well, so uh, from a tax planning standpoint in your 60s Roth conversions the other one is those go-go years if you're making that decision to retire in your 60s likely you're retiring and you've got a long list of things that you want to do that likely will take you about six months to do Uh, (laughs) and then you'll be wondering wait should I go back to work should I did I retire too soon Um, but in that laundry list of things will likely be some higher price tags how do you want to manage those? Are those withdrawals from your IRA? Do you do you finance those with a loan? Do you, what what's the right structure for that? You've got to look at your tax situation for that. Well, that also plays into your investment decisions in your sixties as well, right? Because if if you've got some major big ticket items that are coming early in retirement or some you know specific time frame out in the future, you want to make sure that you have your investments staged to become liquid at the right time to cover those things. Don't wait until the last second when you know it's time to buy that new car and you've got to go cash in some investments to cover it. What if it's a bad time to be cashing in some of those investments? Be proactive in the way that you harvest uh, cash. And and this is where, again, your, your investments have to be part of what you're working with your certified financial planner on. And it's not just if it's a bad time, if it's a bad financial move. Because yeah. I've talked to lots of folks who said, hey, as soon as I retire, I'm going to pull out $250,000. I'm going to pay off all my debt. I'm like, hey, look, if you could tilt that over and pay it over a series of years, financially, you're so much further ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, from an investment standpoint, again, now is a tricky time. When you're retiring, typically you're going to have a, you're going to start reducing your risk. You're going to want to work with the CFP right now to figure out how to do so in this environment. The way bonds are moving right now, and certainly the volatility of the stock market, you're going to want to make sure you do that that uh, that timing approach, uh, in influencing what your investment choices should be. All right, we've got more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. All right, <clears throat> fourth segment. Um, do we clean up? Do we hit questions? Probably both. Okay. What uh, what area should we pick up? Should well, I just open it up and say what we, other big? Did we do is? estate planning? No, we didn't. That's right. Did we do present financial? Planning? We kind of hit that when we were talking spending, mm-hmm. and we we dabbled in that. But maybe there's some additional content that you could throw in. I don't know. I mean, that takes me back to just the to work or not to work. That yeah. is the question, yeah. uh-huh. which we've hit. So estate planning, we'll hit that. And then if there's anything else, and then we'll get into listener questions. And there's lots of questions in here in your 60s. Yeah, that, that might be Craig's question. I'm trying to make sense of all of it. I'm reading it quickly. So we'll air it out on the... I mean, she's... She caps at 50% of his full retirement age amount. Whether she draws it at her full retirement age amount or, or retirement age or age 70. So you, you, she wouldn't wait. Right. Spousal benefit doesn't keep growing past full Correct. retirement age. Correct. Now, oh, yeah, they're both the same age. Okay, that helps. <laughs> I was going to say it gets a little tricky when they're if she is older. Age gap, yeah. And so, okay. All right, we'll hit that one. We'll clean up first. Thanks for being with us today. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, 
Kevin Corhorn and Josh Gregory. Every episode of The Wise Money Show is on the YouTube channel. Go check it out and uh, search The Wise Money Show on YouTube and, uh, and, and follow us there. Leave comments there. Most questions come from there. We've got a couple questions coming up that we're going to hit on this segment uh, that were posted from fans of the show. So let's, let's, before we do that, let's wrap up. We're talking about the most important financial decisions by decade, and we're in, the, we're in your 60s, okay? So a disproportionate number of really important financial decisions are made here. When do you draw Social Security and what's your strategy? What approach do you take with Medicare? Do you go traditional or Part C? Um, what's your tax planning situation as you transition away from the paycheck and and into into retirement? Um, so some of the biggest financial decisions of your life. The area the, the sixth area of your financial life, my financial life, everyone's financial life is estate planning. We haven't touched on that yet. What are some of the big decisions you need to make in your fin- in your 60s? surrounding estate planning? Well, so in your 60s, we've, we've been talking about how maybe one of the major life events that's going to occur in your 60s is retirement. And in retirement, that's often a time when money starts moving from 401ks at work, or maybe you have a 403b at work, and now you're repositioning that money into IRAs and, and things like that. Anytime money starts moving or you start disrupting the apple cart, there's always a risk that maybe some elements of your overall game plan start getting dropped. And the estate plan, or I'm going to point specifically to your beneficiary designations, sometimes can get disrupted because in the in the effort and the, the activity of moving money from one account to another or whatever, you might realize that you never even got a beneficiary added to this account or, boy, this doesn't even match what I've got going on in these other accounts. And so if you just need certain milestones in life to be a reminder to you that the estate plan is something that always needs to be kept up to date. And that specifically includes setting the right beneficiaries on your various accounts, because those often, that's one of the very most efficient ways for you to pass your assets that are left over at the end of your life to the people that you care about. It's quick, it's easy, as long as you have them set up properly. Yeah. Uh, the other one that I think of when it comes to estate planning is, we and we mentioned that in last week's episode because it certainly applies in your 70s and 80s, but are you considering retiring to a different climate? And and if so, typically there's a stage where maybe you'll own both homes. At some point, you you know, later in your 70s or 80s, you'll probably simplify, as Kevin has mentioned, and and just own the one. And I know with housing prices, this is maybe less attractive or less realistic for many people. But, um, you know, my folks, when they retired, they got the place in Florida. And so they had a place in Michigan and a place in Florida. Lots of lots of people do that. And Josh mentioned in last week's show about how that is often the, a catalyst to getting a revocable living trust in place so that you're not having to probate in two different jurisdictions, two different states or counties. Um, by having those both properties that are in different counties, in different states, um, having them both owned by a revocable living trust, that assigns instructions to what should happen to those assets if and when something happens to you that supersede, that you know, don't involve probate or anything like that. So it really simplifies and reduces costs. So if that's you, if that's one of your goals is to buy a second property in, in retirement or at retirement, this is, consider adding or see if you need to add a revocable living trust to your overall estate plan. Doing so, oh, I'll just get that in place and not change anything else. Nah, you need a certain type of will. You need something called a pour over will at that point. You're going to want to make sure your trustees, at least you're considering who are your powers of attorney and who are your trustees. A lot of time you want those to be the same people, but there are some reasons why you want those intentionally different. And so just know that when you add the revocable living trust, that's not just a one-off sort of thing. It requires you to reevaluate your entire estate plan. It's a new operating system. Yeah. And one of the things that I was thinking about, it's not uncommon to work with someone in their 60s who has an estate plan that they created in their 40s. And so when you look at that, a lot of times when, when they were in their 40s, the, the, the people that they're enlisting to do the work when they can't do it anymore, a lot of times th- those are parents. Because if I'm in my 40s, my parents might be in my 60s and 70s. 
Well, now that I'm in my 60s, my parents are in my 80s and 90s. So it's probably time to get your parents out of your estate plan. And you've probably had a chance to observe your children and to say, okay, who's, who is best suited to step in and take care of things at this point in time? And so then you, um, you select those children to either be primary or contingent uh, in order to step in and, and yeah. be power of attorney or whatnot. So I would, I would, and I would also make sure if your parents are still beneficiaries on anything, that could be a hangover for some, from a long time ago, they, they probably shouldn't be getting the money. It's likely that there are good reasons to not make mom and dad the beneficiary of that money. Even if you say, no, 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 my I'm doing okay and my parents are kind of destitute. Um, by giving them a chunk of money at your death, it might disrupt some of the programming that they have in their financial life. Yeah. So I, w- I would look at the, the beneficiaries. And then the other thing that I've noticed in your 60s, you've, in your 60s you've been able to observe your adult children being married for a while. And it it's it's at that point that people are more willing, if they're looking at assets that they're not going to get through in their lifetime, people are more willing to give money to adult children uh, who've been married for a while. Because yeah. it's, it's a risk if you give money to your adult children who are married and there's a divorce. Well, half of what you gave goes away and leaves the family, leaves the bloodlines, if you will. Yep. And so people are like, well, I want to be careful about that. But people they're not less careful about that in their 60s but there's there's just been more you know they say time and truth go hand in hand there's been there's been more time and more truth established and so um people are more comfortable all right any other big financial decisions that we haven't touched on in your 60s uh you know this one <clears throat> uh, this is a bit of a stretch to even call this a financial decision but it's certainly related to the retirement decision. And um, I, I am working with a client who is a doctor and he's been ready to retire financially for a few years, but just has not pulled the trigger yet. And the number one reason for why is he doesn't know what he's going to do with his time when he's done. Mm. And um, it's really kind of uh, helped me be be very awakened to the the fact that This is someone who has significant meaning in the work that he does. He loves it. It's, uh, you know, many doctors, it's kind of part of their identity. It's who they are. They prepared so long, and then they get to give give back to uh, their own communities in in so many ways. And for that to then end may be... uh, traumatic in some ways for for some people oh right? huge if if that if work is my identity and I'll, and that's the that is the situation for a lot of folks they people can feel like hey i'm i'm losing myself yeah yeah and that's why i think it's important to you know we talk about having a budget and and having a, a cash flow plan as you enter into into retirement but it may be just as important or in some cases even more important to have a plan for your time you know, plan your calendar, plan your schedule, and get the right mix of spending or investing of time. Yeah, there's going to be leisure time in there. There's there's stuff that you've wanted to do during your working career. You just didn't have the time to do it. Wouldn't it be awesome to, to pour yourself into that? But at some point down the road, when you've caught every largemouth bass in the county three times, <laughs> at some point you're like, okay, I I need another dose of meaning. Right? No, you move on to pike. Pike, or like all right. A walleye the, the, or something? Yeah, the walleye. No, the, the you move level. on to pickleball and you go get yourself <laughs> That's right. a paddle tech paddle and just... That's right. But after you've smoked every 20-year-old that you know, <laughs> even that you know starts to lose its, its luster. So the point is there has to be some portion of your your calendar or your your weekly schedule where you're pouring yourself into something that is deeply satisfying more than a hobby can provide and that always involves other people and having some kind of an impact that goes beyond your life and i think in your 60s is the time to begin brainstorming and thinking about what's that going to be for me what what am i going to do beyond earning a great paycheck and having a great life and everything how do i have meaning in the next stage of life I'm so glad you brought that up, Josh. We, we it, that thought occurred to me 
when we were talking about the the show on in your seventies and eighties, mm-hmm. and we said you know spend your time well, blah blah blah. But we didn't hit that specifically. There's there's wisdom that you have that the next generation needs. Yes. And there's contribution that yep. the that you have that the world needs. Mm-hmm. And so find that purpose. I'm going to tuck a question in here from Craig. It fits right into what we've been talking about. Wife and I are both 62. She's got enough credits to to get her own Social Security, but the spousal benefit is um, is is higher. So the question is, if I start my Social Security at my full retirement age of 67, and she waits until 70 to start receiving payment, will she receive 50% of my actual payment, or will she receive 50% of my 70, my at 70 payment? So quick quick answer. Go ahead. Go for it. Well, okay, so your spousal benefit, you get the choice. If you've been married or if you are married, you have the choice of collecting your own Social Security or half of your spouse's, whichever is higher. Now, technically, it means you're going to collect your own and then receive a spousal boost, which gets you up to, to 50% of your spouse's, okay? But 50% is, uh, is what normally we, um, I don't know. It would generalize. That's what we would communicate. There's a lot of what ifs, all right? So if you are younger, excuse me, if your spouse is younger, then they'll receive 50% and then they'll receive some early withdrawal discounts. But the other thing, and this speaks directly to your question, Craig, your spousal benefit is capped at 50% of your full retirement age amount. Therefore, if you delay drawing Social Security until age 70, your spouse doesn't get 50% of your age 70 amount. She'll get 50% of your full retirement age amount. And to exactly your question, if you draw at 67, but she chooses to late to wait, she's still capped and will only receive 50% of your age 67 or your full retirement age amount. Does that make any sense, guys? It's complicated how that come I, it out. It is complicated. And I think that maybe the thing to point out here is that there's a difference between a spousal benefit and a survivor benefit. Survivor benefit can keep on growing past uh, the full retirement age. That can you can maximize your own benefit by delaying to age seventy, and your spouse would get a better benefit if you pass away. But during your lifetime, if your spouse is going to draw off of yours, it's capped at full retirement age. It doesn't keep on growing in those yeah, bonus years. That's right. Work with your CFP. Have a strategy to see when you should draw, especially if you've been married or you are married. Optimize that with your certified financial planner. All right. That's all the time we have for today. On behalf of Josh Gregory, Kevin Corhorn, myself, and all of us over at Corhorn Financial Group, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group. KFG Wealth Management, LLC and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.